Kai Sakura, an average teenager with useless skills serving in the army, monitors the demon prison with his friends. He sets his sights on clapping the most talented chick in their branch. However, his dream doesn't come true, as a portal appears out of nowhere, transporting him into a timeline where the demons are free. Standing at the top of the largest tower that seems like touching the sky, Kai faces an interesting being. As her white feathers molt from her wing, he wonders if she is an angel. However, black wings molt for her other wing, making him question if reading too many stupid comments is causing blindness. Seconds later, she opens her lifeless eyes and asks who's there, stunning him. When the blurriness goes away, she begs him to free her from these chains. Kai is hit with a bizarre feeling. He can't believe that a godly creature like her is asking him, a mere human who wants to lift her legs and enter the dragon for help. Something like this can't be possible in his mind. The thing is alternate races and humans have waged fierce wars against each other since the dawn of time. That is the history he knows. And that is how things are supposed to be. Kai yells and asks why doesn't anyone remember the real world, maybe the Matrix got to them first. Earlier that morning, Kai stopped his car miles away from his destination to monitor the situation. Ashran wants him to be cautious and call it quits. However, Saki reminds him about Kai's habit of monitoring the graveyard for 300 seconds. Ashran is feeling the pressure down there, and so tells him to hurry up. But Kai straight up says his poop is none of his concern. The demons are creatures who possess the mightiest of magical powers. The celestials are demi-humans like angels and elves. The spirits are creatures that possess special kinds of bodies such as ghosts. And here you thought I was talking about cup size. Mythical beasts are colossal beasts like dragons. The war between these four races and humanity have left them helpless. They can't let another great ninja war between the five races to ever occur again. The Urza Federation is tasked with monitoring the graveyard where the demons have been sealed. After completing 300 seconds, he concludes the demons are Netflix and chilling or clapping with each other's wives. With no activity, he returns to the van. Ashran comments on him being like his dad never came back after going out to buy milk. However, Saki thinks Kai's behavior is a blessing since they get paid for being useless. He believes that Sid defeated the four heroes using the shining sword given to him by the prophetic god Arsal Salaka. Ashran asks if the demons ever even tried to escape from graveyard in the last hundred years. Nor are they introverts in heaven. Kai reveals that no demons have escaped. But it is their job as the human Aegis Agency to keep such outcomes from happening. They know he makes a fair argument. But Ashran asks why he is serious about the demon graveyard, while the other fours are not taken seriously. Kai counters his argument, saying the people assigned to the other four graveyards do their jobs very well. His job is to stop a demon from ever escaping otherwise, there will be no fake vaccine for this catastrophe. Saki, born without brain cells, reminds him that a demon never escaped and the world is at peace. Kai thanks her for pointing out the obvious. However, keeping his guard up is the best humanity can do. Back in the city of Vishal, the group reports back to the human Aegis Agency Vishal branch. Kai doesn't waste any time getting his pump. He defeats the NPC human hologram and goes into extreme mode. The AI system in the facility warns him, claiming a low-level soldier like him can't defeat the dragon. Kai dodges its tail attack and sneaks in behind from its backside. Taking advantage of its size, he targets a blind spot on its leg. However, his strength is far from dealing damage to a mythical beast. The dragon is about to smoke his ass, but Saki shuts down the hologram. She wants to know if he plans on dying before losing his V-Bar on Instagram Live. Kai claims that his training will bear fruit only if it's challenging enough otherwise he could just clap her for some cardio. Judging from his attitude, Saki says he should have been born during the Great War between the five races. Most definitely his name would have gone down in history like Prophet Sid. With all honesty, he confesses that his abilities are far from the great hero who defeated the heroes of the other races. 
Saki can't imagine how he defeated those four heroes. The hero of the demon's dark empress Vanessa, the hero of the celestial's heavenly lord Alfreya, the hero of the spirit's Rikujin Kyoko otherwise known as the spirit sovereign and lastly the hero of the mythical beast Fang King Rathel. However, it is still uncertain that Sid and his sword actually existed in their world, since the other heroes have videos on YouTube, but none are about him. Anyhow, Saki ends their conversation anti-calmly to ask Asran about his condition. They need to buy Jean a gift for her transfer. She is the only soldier who is going to get a transfer at the age of 17. Asran thinks a bouquet of flowers will do the trick. But Saki knows everyone will give her that. She wants to make things special for her. At that moment, Kai receives a message from her, asking to meet downtown without telling Saki and Ashran. Naturally, the two think Kai is going to give her his tool as a gift. However, he runs off before being forced to answer unnecessary questions. For the first time ever, Jean arrives on time. Kai had thought he would have to wait hours, making her pout. Nonetheless, they start their date in the typical fashion by breaking the man's bank account. She wants to buy a gift for Ashran and Saki before leaving. Kai reminds her that the transfer is going to last for two years. She knows it but most probably they will become civilians after two periods. They are the only loners who sold their souls to the government and will continue giving fan service to the army. Kai changes the topic, diverting her attention toward the goal of surpassing the chief of the royal branch who is also her father. With that in mind, they enjoy their final date together shopping for others. While waiting for the signal to turn green, she mentions that her father took him to the demon graveyard at 10 years old. After returning from the trip, he started ranting about seeing Sid's golden sword. Kai remembers the moment vividly when he touched the sword and it flowed into him. However, he refrained from sharing this info, as people would call him crazy. It was at that moment when Kai was dead focused on keeping the demons in check. Jean runs into the middle of the street, asking if she will be his future waifu. Suddenly, Kai Mercy, sees the Matrix glitching. He calls out her name in panic, but the others can't see this crisis happening. A strange voice orders the world to rewrite its history and execute the command immediately. A portal appears right above Jean, transferring into a world full of ruins. In the next moment, he finds himself in the middle of nowhere. Confused, Kai looks around in search of someone. Unexpectedly, he encounters a demon at the next corner, leaving him rocked. The demon allows him to experience magic firsthand. Luckily, he dodges the attacks thanks to his training with the holograms. The demons cast four spells simultaneously. Kai uses his sword gun to fire bullets made from elvish magic. As a result, he cancels out the attacks, impressing the demon. Pissed off, the demon casts a magic circle on his feet. However, Kai escapes in time to launch a counterattack. He runs at him without looking back, but his sword can't pierce its skin. Kai fires a bullet made to recreate Dragon's breath, killing the demon. As Kai realizes that his training paid off big time, a high-level demon shows up to congratulate him. He can't believe a mere human slave killed a demon. He deems Kai dangerous and treats him with respect. Just as he is about to become Sikh Kebab, Saki comes to rescue him with a flash bomb. She pulls him inside the wand and reports the wanderer has been secured. For some reason, she refers to him as a hunter and asks about his origins. At first, Kai thinks she is playing a prank on him. However, after a while, realizes both Saki and Ashran don't remember him. He reminds them about the Human Aegis Agency and their friendship. They have never heard about the Human Aegis Agencies and claim to be soldiers of the Resistance. Honestly, she is shocked that Kai doesn't know about the Human Rebel Army. Ashran explains that 30 years ago the humans lost the Great War between the five races and got wiped out. The other races have taken control of their cities, forcing them to run and hide for survival. At this point, he realizes they are driving on the streets of Vishal City. Ultimately, they take him underground to the city of Neo Vishal. Humanity used what was left to build underground strongholds to be safe from demons. 
Despite the situation, he can't understand why humanity lost the war. Saki asks if he really saw the giant demon trying to kill him. Ashran adds to this, revealing the four races have their own heroes. Naturally, Kai wants to know how they could lose when Prophet Sid was on their side. Unfortunately, they neither know about Sid or his golden sword. Suddenly, the crowd gathers as the main corps led by the commander returns from duty. Saki claims that Jean is the most fierce man in their army. They report there were no abnormalities in Vishal Town aside from a giant demon trying to kill them. They also introduce Kai as a harmless bird with no memories. In the meantime, he stands there in shock, as his childhood friend does not remember him. As he, she, or whatever walks past her, Kai loses it. He bluntly asks why she is playing a man and not focusing on her dream to surpass the chief while being a girl. She stops for a moment but her soldier shuts his mouth from spouting nonsense. Inside the room, he finds no clue about him or Sid. However, the graveyards where the demons were supposed to be sealed still exist. Kai asks Ashran to lend him his truck for a bit. He casually throws the keys, not realizing what is happening. Saki makes him realize his actions, but he claims to have instinctively given him the keys. He enters the graveyard and finds the golden sword of Sid. Upon drawing the sword, he is transported to a tower where a girl begs him to free her. Kai is stunned to see a new kind of race in front of him. She repeatedly asks him to liberate her from the chains. Upon regaining full consciousness, she asks his name and purpose. However, Kai is too starstruck to answer and so he just repeats the question like a person with zero brain cells. She reveals her name to be Rin. For some reason, he is having some mental breakdown, as Kai asks if that is her name. He continues with the question, asking if she is a demon or not. Once again, Rin asks him to break the chains. After a brief thought, he walks behind the pillar and observes the situation. He hopes she will not randomly incinerate his ass upon regaining freedom. Kai musters up his strength and attacks the chains. However, his attack doesn't graze the chain. He switches it to shotgun mode and blasts the pillar. But again, his attack is nullified instantly. At that moment, Kai remembers that Sid's golden blade is in his inventory. He tries to summon it with the password, code holder, transforming his normal sword into the legendary blade. This time around, Kai is hesitant to try again. However, his determination to defeat the demons is more stronger than anxiety. He strikes the tower and for a moment it feels like everything was sliced in half. Seconds later, all of the chains on the pillar are sliced in half, and thus freeing Rin. Kai supports her lifeless body and places her on the ground. A few moments later, she opens her eyes and finds him asking about her health. He also confirms if she is awake or lucid dreaming. She immediately flaps her half-angel and half-demon wings to make some distance between them. After taking a deep breath, she yells at Vanessa, the dark empress of demons which creates a wind pressure that can blow him away. She wants her to come out of hiding and continue the fight. No way in hell. She is going to admit defeat to a lowly demon girl who got used by everyone. She believes that sending a wimpy low-level demon with zero fashion sense and experience with handling girls is more than a joke. Kai asks for a timeout. But women don't listen to logic or reason. She wants him to run along like a good puppy and bring his master Vanessa. This chick is so impatient that she casts a light attribute magic spell at him before getting his answer. I am sure she was born six months early like some of you who comment before watching the full video. Kai barely moves out of the way, but Rin casts another spell before he can find his balance. He knows her attack will hit and roast his ass. Unexpectedly, a mysterious woman tells him that the code holder in his hand can severe fate itself. As the world moves in slow motion, she asks him to severe the meaningless fate of death from this world. He instinctively cuts through the spell and makes it vanish, shocking her. Even if he doesn't understand what happened, he plays it cool. She wants to know how a low-level demon cancelled out her spell. Kai yells that there is no demon here. He doesn't have a tail or wings, 
proving his race is human. He clarifies they are not enemies to begin with so stop blasting spells. Rin reveals she holds a deep grudge against demons, and so she attacked without thinking. Kai asks about her race. However, she deflects the question, saying it doesn't matter. She is willing to apologize for the attack. But Kai can't ask about her race again. Naturally, Kai is curious about the place and who captured her. Unfortunately, she doesn't remember anything on that part. She was fighting Vanessa and then suddenly was teleported here. Kai cleans his ears out and wonders if he heard correctly. He asks if she is talking about the Dark Empress of the Demon and their hero Vanessa. Rin claims to be so powerful that she can school heroes like Vanessa. She can also easily wipe out an army of demons. However, she doesn't act stingy when complimenting Kai for countering her attack. She wants to know how that was possible. Kai humbly gives the credit to Sid's sword, once again acting upon his good nature. Suddenly, a strange creature came crawling out of the portal. It claims that Fate's singularity entity has awakened. She is at the worst threat level in this new world. It must immediately commence removing the last riser's seal. The monster attacks with its centerpiece tail. However, Kai pushes her out of the way. Utilizing its support, the main body tries to slam dunk them from above. But Kai and Rin move out of the way. The tail has enough power to absorb the pillar's tower and destroy it. As the chimera directs its attention towards them, Kai tells Rin to hold his hand and run away. For a moment, Kai believes his escape plan is a success. Unfortunately for them, the monster creates a portal and sticks its tail inside it. The exit opens right behind Rin and captures her. She screams like a little girl, which makes you wonder where all that power just flew out. The monster confirms that the threat has been captured while Rin just screams like a three-year-old nutcase. It also commences the Zero Code, a process of eliminating every atom in the person's body. During this time, Kai just stands there like a clown and watches Sunday Night Live with Jimmy Kimmel. Just as she is about to be blown off, he feels frustrated with himself for staying still. He rushes forward and slices the tail in half, freeing Rinny. The monster wonders why the Forbidden Sword is present at the graveyard. Kai's sword slash opens a portal back to where Kai found the sword. Rin immediately hugs her, claiming she was scared to death. Kai asks if she has any family in the world. She reveals that the Celestials, Spirits and the Mythical Beasts didn't accept her as a part of them. The demon race was the cruelest of them all. They called her an abomination of nature. That is the reason she and Vanessa were fighting before this happened. Kai can resonate with her because nobody in this world remembers him. Plus the history he remembers is when the humans won the war between the five races and lived peacefully. But now the vile demons have taken over their cities. Rin is confused by his explanation because demons taking over human cities is just fantasy. The last time she met the demons, they were completely pissed about losing the war to the human hero. Kai abruptly grabs her by the shoulders, asking if she really knows about Sid. Unfortunately, she doesn't remember his name. On that note, they step outside the graveyard. Unexpectedly, she falls down due to fatigue from being captured and attacked by the monster. Kai carries her on his shoulders and explains they are going to head back to the human city. Naturally, she doesn't want people to judge her and refuses. But Kai convinces her to trust him. She makes a huge fuss in the car, thinking that it's another cage. She also stands out in the city like a sore thumb. Worst of all, Rin tries to murder people using her magic, but Kai stops her. Still, he doesn't blame her for acting this way. It's natural that she is cautious around strangers. In the meantime, he overhears her singing in the bathroom. Kai always thought it was a human thing, but I guess angels like to pleasure themselves as well. Suddenly, she comes out of the bathroom, claiming the water won't stop. Just to be clear she is talking about the cap you dirty minds. Kai quickly turns away and asks her to wrap a bath towel. He closes the tap and hopes Rin won't just pull something like that cause his heart is weak. She claims that humans are unfair for bathing in stream water despite the demons fudging them up. 
She always bathes in cold freezing water from the lake and pond. Plus, their bed is way too soft for a race who is fighting for their survival. Late that night, Rin abruptly wakes him from a deep sleep, leading him to fall down from the bed. She senses strong magic from outside, telling him the demons are attacking the city. He rushes outside to find everything in flames. Humans are panicking and running to the shelters, making him realize that humanity is pushed into a corner. Rin tightly clings to him with fear, but Kai tells her to let go. He understands that playing the role of Sid in this world is his responsibility. Saki and Ashrin attack the demon with guns. However, their weakly bullets can't pierce the demon's skin. With no choice left, Ashrin tells her to bring out the machine guns while he keeps the demons in check. Unfortunately, his words are like his hair, putting Saki in grave danger. At that moment, Kai arrives on the scene and tells her to duck. He blasts the demon with his shotgun sword, shocking her. Once done, he orders her to use water against the gargoyles. He explains that their stone bodies will become too heavy to fly after absorbing water. Afterward, she should hit them with a grenade to blow them to bits. In the meantime, the demons cast petrification magic on Ashran. Kai, quick on his feet, shatters the circle with his bullet. Simultaneously, Rin arrives on the scene and destroys the demon with lighting magic. The two of them have never seen the technology and strategy Kai implemented in his battle. Eventually, he reveals that Rin and him are from the world where the humans won the great war between the five races. Seconds later, Ashrin receives word that two demon scouts have spaced from their clutches, meaning more demons will come. With no choice left, they plan to take Kai and Rin to the headquarters for Jean to decide their faith. He tells the commander and the war councils about the world where humans won the war. Naturally, they think he's been smoking weed for God knows how long. But Jean noticed that he talked with her in a tone of familiarity. Kai reveals their relationship and claims Jean always wanted to be like her father and grandfather. Shocked, she stands up and ends the meeting. Later, Jean's assistant knocks on their room and invites them to her quarters. She doesn't believe his complete story but can't ignore his fighting ability. She wants to launch an all-out attack against the demon forces in collaboration with the five human cities. Rin speaks up, saying her plan would worsen their situation. The battle will capture the attention of the entire demon race, fast-forwarding their annihilation. Jean yells at them asking what to do. After thinking a bit, Kai claims their only option is to attack the royal capital and defeat the hero of the demons. He explains that most of the demons' forces are fighting the other races on the borders. Only 10% of the forces are deployed in the royal capital. He wants Rin and him to fight with Vanessa directly. Jean says most of their forces before reaching them to provide backup. At that moment, her assistant reveals Jean's father prepared a strategy to enter the royal capital through the train tracks. However, they didn't have any means to fight with Vanessa at that moment. But now their only option is to launch an attack to save their city. On their way to the palace where Vanessa resides, Rin goes over the list of what she hates. First in the list are demons. She hates them because of their deceitfulness. She hates spirits because they're creepy, which is just racist, to be honest. She hates mythical creatures because they are barbaric creatures from Vikings or Game of Thrones. Lastly, she hates humans because they are weak, and no one can argue with that. And she hates herself because she is a mixture of all the races. Hats of her mother for handling this much pounding. However, Kai is not the same as everyone else. He is the only one who embraced her without knowing her race or origin story. She gives him a gentle smile, hoping he won't rage quit living because of his V-status. As the journey continues, Saki informs them that their small fleet is the backbone of this mission. They will enter the government palace via the underground passageway which was originally made by the queen to sneak in her BBC lovers. They will strike the main hub of the demons while the main forces led by the commander will keep the majority of demons busy. Their task is to free the captives in the basements and defeat Vanessa. It all sounds like roses and cherries but Vanessa can smoke their asses. 
With Jean in the lead, she believes that their plan will be a success. The only thing in this plan that Saki is worried about is that they are the assault team tasked with offering Vanessa. She can't believe what the rebel army expects the four of them can do to the Dark Empress. Like Kai explained 100 times before, they need to strike Vanessa with stealth. They can't just barge in through the back door with 1,000 soldiers. Saki continues complaining and whining like a bitch, asking why she's a part of it. Kai claims the only people he can trust fully are her and Ashram. She understands that too but her complaints don't end, as some things are just scary to begin with. Rin pats her head like a dog to make her feel good. And surprisingly, Saki tells her that it is working. Since Saki is Kai's close friend, she is very special. She tells her not to worry and trust in her strong abilities, which haven't been shown in three episodes. She probably won't lose to anyone but Vanessa. Saki asks what will happen if it's Vanessa. Rin goes silent and rolls her eyes to the side. Saki raises her voice and repeats the question. Despite her confusion, Rin is positive that she will self-destruct when things come down to it. Ashran is worried that the demons will spot them traveling in a large group. However, Kai reminds him that demons are sensitive to magic power. And since humans are weak as hell, they are invisible to the demons. On a usual day they would take it as an insult. Kai notices that Ashrain is calmer than usual. He tells them to glance at his hands which have been shaking from the start. That aside, if they take out the demons then their names will be the talk amongst all the races. They might also land some bitches and earn a handsome reward for their efforts. Kai comments that he's more reliable than the Ashran he knows. He would have been shitting his pants by now. Upon reaching the mission site, Jean addresses her forces, acknowledging their confusion and nervousness. However, she reminds them that humans have been fighting against demon oppression. As they take charge towards the palace, low-level demons step outside. One of them casts a freeze spell. But Kai already knows how to counter it. He blasts the demon at point-blank range, earning him a flawless victory. The demons start appearing from magic circles on the pillar. He works together with Rin to take them out in one swoop. The others can't believe that a bullet can unleash a wide-range attack defeating all the demons. But Kai claims that it was his weapon who defeated them. He quickly changes the topic, informing them about his intentions to attack the top floor. Jean reveals that the elevator and the stairs are too exposed. Phelan suggests that they should use the emergency stairs on the south side. On that note, Jean orders Group 1 to stay outside and stop any demon from entering the palace. She tasks Group 2 with releasing the prisoners from the basement. At the same time, they head out to the south stairs. On their way, Phelan asks how a bullet can be fired without Kai pulling a trigger. She always sensed a strange presence coming from Rin. However, Jean reminds her that Kai is going to fight with Vanessa. That much is enough at the moment. Suddenly, an imp summons a large army of demons to fight them. Rin had already pointed out his location, allowing them to evade the first move. Phelan takes responsibility for fighting the demon, allowing them to continue their journey. Unexpectedly, Jean rashly steps inside a room on the next turn, triggering a powerful lighting magic trap. Unexpectedly, the trap doesn't phase her because of the elven garments underneath her armor, and yes it's probably her bikini and panties. Rin instantly recognizes the magic item cherished by the elves. Jean confirms her suspicion, revealing its elvish technology called the Sacred Light Garment. It was seized from them during their last big fight and its magical resistance is unparalleled. She tells the four of them to continue and leave the demon to them. After they leave, she announces that the demon will be fighting the Knight of the Sacred Light. On the other hand, Kai and the others climb the tower. Rin casts a barrier magic around them so that demons can't sense their presence. She mistakenly calls it magic, forcing Kai to cover for her. Just as planned, the demon passes by without noticing them. Saki gets scared of its presence but Rin calms her down. Unfortunately, the infrared sensors in the palace built by the humans sound the alarm. 
Kai and Rin head to the surveillance room to find high-level demons using an iPhone. He reveals that the demon hero is impressed by their inventions and wanted the demons to make use of it. Suddenly, Rin pulls a sacrificial move. She pushes Kai outside the room and freezes the entrance, forcing him to continue to the top of the tower. There he finds Vanessa who seems to be a succubus. Now you know she climbed her way up the ladder. Downstairs, the demon continues mocking Jean for being weak. He unleashes a fire breath at her. However, the elven garment repels the attack with zero damage. Things don't end there, as Jean unlocks the secret form of her sword, transforming it into the longbow of the moon. The arrow pierces the demon's skin and blasts the living shit out of it. At this point, the demon realizes she is using elven armor and angelic weapons. For someone without magic to use these weapons means chipping away their life force. Jean ends the demon's life, claiming that sacrificing her life is the resolve humanity needs to win against demons and other races. Out of nowhere, a demon breaks the back wall, attacking her from behind. Unexpectedly, Phelan appears out of the blue and kills the demon. The demon asks if she is the soldier who uses Drake's fang as their main weapon but she isn't in the mood to reveal anything. Up top, Vanessa asks him to put down his weapon, as any human would be surprised to see that the demonic hero is a succubus. She doesn't mind making love to him to pass the time. However, our Gigachad doesn't fall for big milkers, well at least when she is a blood-sucking demon who wants to enslave you. She was hoping to make him her slave with one charm, However, she didn't expect that a human who gets a boner every morning would refuse her body. She thinks that he's the human who uses Elvin's garments in the army. Kai clarifies that he's an outsider who came from another world where history claims their defeat. Being arrogant, Vanessa states that such a world never could or will exist. However, Kai continues explaining that he was summoned into this world without his will. The history he remembers is the one where the great war among the five races is long in the past. Upon hearing this, she asks which of the five races won the war. Kai answers her question, claiming the humans won the war. Initially, she is shocked not knowing if Kai hid his head somewhere. She laughs at the fact that the demons, spirits, or mythical beasts could defeat the humans. Still, just to fulfill her curiosity, she asks who was the one who defeated them in his delusions. Without any hesitation, Kai states the name Prophet Sid. For some reason, the word Sid reminds her of other words like sword, code holder, graveyard, and most concerning world reincarnation. Kai wants her to expand on these words and thoughts. However, Vanessa claims that the Dark Empress doesn't need to concern herself with such atrocities. She cuts to the chase and attacks Kai. Unexpectedly for her, Kai counters her attack with his weapon and closes the distance between them. He lands a fatal blow on her, but she replaces her body with an inclusion. Once that happens, she blasts him away with a simple explosion spell. Vanessa realizes that his weapon has the same properties as Drake's breath. She concludes it is also from another world. However, she doesn't care enough to chit-chat about the other world. She casts a powerful fire spell, blowing a hole through the walls. But Kai manages to evade the attack. Afterward, she casts a magic circle underneath the ground, making it impossible for him to doge. The impact from the attack causes the whole palace to shake, worrying Rin. She accepts that he will die from the attack. However, Kai's or Sid's sword saves his lie yet again. Vanessa is really interested in his sword. But before he could answer, Rin appeared on the scene and attacked her. Right after, the strange portal from the graveyard appeared. From it the mysterious creature arrives, claiming that Vanessa is showing unexpected fluctuation due to the taboo word Sid. She holds Vanessa and concludes that inclusion by Last Riser. At this point, she understands what's going on here. However, Rasterizer B claims that she is a threat to this world and must be eliminated. She executes Code Zero just like with Rin. As Vanessa's body deteriorates, she activates her hidden magic enhancing her strength. She asks if a mere dog of Alfreya dares to think it can kill the Dark Empress. 
She unleashes a spell at point black range, which destroys everything outside the palace as well. Kai can't believe that Rin was fighting this monster before coming to this world. However, she claims that Vanessa wasn't this strong back in the real world. She is so strong that her legs are shaking from fear. After dealing with the unannounced interventions, she tells Kai that their battle will continue. After appearing out of a portal, Sasterbur B observes strange fluctuation coming from Vanessa. I could bet it is from her assets dangling left and right. She initiates the extermination process, activating Code Zero. A strange type of magic begins to erase parts of her. Naturally, the hero of the demons didn't attain the title from a drinking competition. She buffs her stats and cup size to unleash a calamity level spell to fry her brain. Rasterber B knows that Vanessa is in cooking mode, and so she retreats for the time being. Kai can't believe his eyes. More so, he can't understand how the fudge was Rin fighting her back in their real world. Rin clarifies that Vanessa is far worse. I mean sure, she was strong in their world, but this is something beyond expected. All that I am the strongest takes fade, as her legs begin to tremble. In the meantime, the succubus demon lord heals her wounds. She wants to focus on getting rid of the weaklings in front of her. She descends to the ground, and contracts her wings to prepare a strike befitting the hero of humanity. Shocking for pretty much everyone, Rin takes action before anyone else. She holds her by the waist, as not to act naughty and fulfill her fetish, but to cast a shadow prison, a barrier from the spirit race, she tells Kai to run away because Vanessa is cooking. Unfortunately, she clarifies that a weak barrier from the spirit race isn't going to stop her. She unleashes her magical power in all directions to blow away barriers. As a result, Rin is sent flying. Despite her warnings to Kai, he leaps in for the attack with his mind clouded by anger. At that moment, Vanessa calls him an eyesore and casts an inferno spell at point-blank range. The impact sends him flying into the nearest wall. Seeing the life fade from his hands, Rin shouts out his name, hoping his heart will jumpstart. Vanessa rips the bandage, delivering the news that he's off. Yet, Rin doesn't want to believe it. Fast forward, she wants to know about her next move. Will she foolishly seek revenge or try to escape on her own? As she silently stands up, Vanessa assumes that Rin even lost her will to respond. However, unbeknownst to her, she rises in anger. A dark aura surrounds her body, leaving her confused. Even her wounds miraculously heal with a trace. Rin states that she will never forgive her for killing Kai. She repeats this phrase over and over, transforming it into a creature made from the five races combined. Naturally, even Vanessa can't comprehend the origins of her chaotic appearance. She asks her to give the hero a walkthrough like in the other anime. But Rin rudely tells her to shut up and attacks. Her punch for a moment makes her see the grave. She questions her true nature. However, Rin continues attacking without any rashness. She pushes Vanessa a few steps back with Goku voice over. Unfortunately, this doesn't last long as she straight up blocks her punch as the two are in a stalemate, Vanessa takes advantage of psychology to traumatize Rin. She claims that using this form earlier in battle would have at least allowed Kai to escape. However, she was scared to show him her true self. She feared being called a monster from the one person she loved. Technically, she is the one who killed him, not her. Rin already knew this, but realizes that regret won't bring him back. Still, she can make her die with her. She locks hands with her, reciting a strong curse spell. Her life force invades Vanessa's body to overflow the glass. She claims that each droplet of blood dripping from them reduces their life spans. No spell in her arsenal can counter Rin's spell. All she can do is call her names like abomination and stuff. Suddenly, all of Rin's magic power depletes in an instant, making her fall on her knees. Obviously, she can't understand why the suicidal act failed. Vanessa reminds her that even curse magic relies on her magical powers, making it the reason she lost. Since this is the demon's main nest, 
She had already prepared countermeasures for the other three races excluding the humans. A wide-range hex that transfers magic power from the other races into her body. However, the effects on Rin's body were threefold because of her mixed blood. Honestly, she can't really get why a creature like her was born into this world. Still, she will do her the favor of offing her. In the end, Rin apologizes to Kai for failing him, but she claims to have tried to do her best. On that note, Vanessa casts a fire spell to end her life. As the smoke clears up, both girls are left speechless. Kai blocks the attacks, saving Rin, and says there is no need to apologize. He claims that their struggles so far would have gone to hell if she hadn't stepped in to fight. He was unconscious all this time due to the previous attack. She asks if this is a dream, but the warmth of his body relieves her worries. In the meantime, Vanessa wants to know how he survived the previous attack. She claims that humans can't live through a close-range explosion. Naturally, Kai used Sid's code holder at the last moment to reduce the damage of the attack. Nonetheless, he draws her sword against Vanessa because the responsibilities on his shoulders are vast. But, she is pissed off that a human dares to stand against her with that attitude. She claims he is just lucky to survive two hits from the explosion. He is an insect who barely climbs back up while Rin was fighting her. Kai agrees with her statements, claiming that this is exactly the reason he can't stop fighting. Rin and the others fought with their lives on the line just so they could exchange swords. The least he can do for them is show her their determination. Vanessa laughs wondering what new things will Kai show her. She knows the human mind all too well. They all proclaim to showcase the will, the potential, and the future of humanity. But in the end, they were all lips. The spirit sovereign Rikujin Kayoko, the lord of heaven Elfria, and the Fang King Rath-El are all nuisances. However, she respects them as leaders of their clans with absolute strength. But humans have no hero. She asks Kai if he is here to announce himself as one. He isn't interested in titles, just titties. Still, he will gladly answer her first question. Kai intends to show her their spirit. In this world where there is no prophet said to fight for the humans, he will take up the sword and fight as humans' representatives. Vanessa doesn't know what he can do, but why not give them a chance? She casts Devil's Planet, a meteorite from above. Kai asks Code Holder to answer in kind. He unleashes multiple slash attacks to destroy the magic. Vanessa is impressed by his ability to nullify her magic. However, she reveals more cards under her sleeves a powerful wide area spell to attack both of them. At that moment, Kai signals to his team to turn off the lights, limiting Vanessa's vision. She realizes that humans don't have magic power, making them impossible to detect in the dark. She attacks by seeing the glow of Code Holder. Unfortunately, Kai gave her sword to Rin to act as a distraction. On the other hand, he sneaks up behind her in preparation for the final attack. He has been practicing for 10 years at this very moment. Rin throws Code Holder at him, allowing him to land a deceived strike. Before the strike lands, Vanessar realizes her defeat. She willingly gives the royal capital back to the humans. Suddenly, her body starts to break due to Code Holder's effect. Not only that, the shackles on her memories are also broken. She remembers Sid, the prophet like it was yesterday. She can't believe that she messed up this badly. In addition, she knows something about the world reincarnation as well. She remembers that wretched Sid was talking about this phenomenon during their last period. Kai wants to know the truth about everything, mainly why Sid was sliding into her DMs. She claims that the world was rewritten. Sid called this phenomenon world reincarnation. He can't believe that Sid predicted that something like this would happen. Vanessa explains that one of the three heroes reincarnated the entire world, changing its history in their favor. Sid not only foresaw the entire thing happening, he even gave his sword to Vanessa for safekeeping. In reality, she was the one who hid in the graveyard to prepare for what was to come next. She claims that the code holder is the only way to correct the alterations in this new world. 
even though Kai still can't understand how Sid can entrust his sword to the hero of the demons. He mentions the records of them fighting during the Great War of the Five Races. Vanessa claims that those records are true, but there is a part of history that was hidden away from them. That history is called the Forbidden Code otherwise known as the Zero Code. It is a troublesome magic kept secret from the masses. Before turning into dust, she compliments them for using the dark to his advantage and having the courage to fight her without Sid's sword. She finally understands the human spirit and is frustrated like hell with this loss. However, making excuses is a habit of losers. She promises to make love to him the next time they meet and vanishes into dust. Sometime later, the Calm reports to the rebel army around the world that Jean has successfully taken back the royal capital, giving the humans something to celebrate. The members all sleep like babies to recover from the fatigue of battle. On the other hand, Kai is worried about finding the truth behind the fake world. For now, all they know is that something happened and they are the only ones who aren't affected by it. Rin mentions that this world is far scarier than their previous one. Moments later, Jean comes to the rooftop with Phelan. First and foremost, she thanks Kai and Rin on behalf of the entire rebel army for defeating Vanessa. Furthermore, she plans to leave the reconstruction of the city to the old dudes in the offices. In the meantime, they are planning to gather forces from all four major reasons that were captured by each race for a large-scale operation. She hopes that Kai and Rin will lend them their aid once again. Kai naturally agrees to her request, as their goals are aligned. Out of all people, Rin finds herself running from a mysterious thing in an area filled with white towers. The area is similar to the demon graveyards, but the only difference is a man dressed in all black. He tells them to follow him somewhere away from the threat. Amidst their escape, the man says something. But Rynin wakes up from the noise before hearing the important part. Ashran voices his opinion that fighting with the demons was a suicide attempt. In any case, they won through miracles. But now, they have to take a bigger risk and visit the Federation. Everything is planned to kill him. Saki tells him to quit complaining like a spoiled brat and be good with it. She reminds them that the Federation personally requested their squad's assistance for the grand mission. This is the turning point of the war where Jean is standing in the front, leading everyone out of the Dark Ages. They can't just abandon their duty just because he is not feeling like going. In the middle of their nonsense, Kai hopes that the royal capital will be rebuilt before they come back. Saki appreciates the positivity but reminds him that the demons can attack the place anytime. This reminds him of the day demons arrived at the royal capital five days after Vanessa was defeated. Rin and Kai were chilling on the ground, watching the people rebuild the royal capital with passion. Suddenly, she sensed a powerful demonic presence nearby. They rush to the top of the castle, but the presence suddenly disappears. Just as Kai is about to let his guard down, Rin warns him that there is a trap set for them. Suddenly, a demon casts a barrier around the entire castle with little effort. Kai can't believe they jumped on once again. At that moment, Heinrol eases her wings and posture, surprised to see the humans who took down her dearest elder sister Vanessa. Kai steps back in shock at the scenario, but his reflexes are top-notch. He quickly draws his weapon and activates Code Holder to counter her spell. Despite slicing her attack into nothingness, Heinmerl isn't phased by his display. She sneaks up behind him to blast his head off. However, Rin tightly grips her hand before it can touch him. She makes it clear that Heinmerl can't touch him at all costs. On that note, she breaks free from her rip and returns to her original place beside the other two demons. Kai can't get a normal read on her intentions. She claims that they wanted to meet him and say hello. She introduces herself as another succubus related to Vanessa. Kai ups his guard as her pressure is almost equal to that of Vanessa. In her hometown, she heard a rumor that Vanessa was defeated. And what's surprising is that the humans were the ones to complete the job. Still, it seems to her that they managed to defeat Vanessa with a series of miracles. It was like putting one million dollars on red and winning. 
However, the three of them can take back the royal capital without breaking a sweat. But she doesn't want to get hasty. The real reason for her visit is to call a truce. It isn't every day you get to be the leader of the demon race. Plus, it was all thanks to a puny human. She will let him have the royal capital if their other territories are not disturbed. Instead of fighting them, they can pick a fight with the other three races. Kai realizes that she wants the four races to fight amongst themselves. He understands the language of succubi. However, his rank does not permit him to make the call without Jean. Before flying out of there, she warns Kai to be aware of Alfreya, the Lord of the Heavens and the Hero of the Celestials. According to her, he has been acting really weird lately. In the present, Kai suggests that Asran should focus on the mission ahead. The rebuilding of the royal capital is not their problem anymore. Their mission is to cooperate with the rebel army in the Federation and take back the territory from the Celestials. Saki confirms if the Celestials are an alliance race with elves, dwarves, fairies, and angels. Kai claims that the Celestials are a cowardly race who are more cunning than the humans. They develop magical tools to fight and enhance their strength. If humans consider demons to be monsters, then the Celestials can be considered enhanced humans. In the middle of their conversation, Jean announces that they will rest in a facility not far from their location. It has not been maintained for years, but a proper rest still might be possible. In the meantime, Rin peacefully enjoys her leg space with no one in the back. However, her fun ends when she senses a presence nearby. She panics and tells them to open the window. Kai follows her instruction, opening the roof ceiling only to find a freaking dragon scouting them. He reports the situation immediately to Jean who passes his message forward. Every member from each car equips their weapons and fires at the dragon. Naturally, none of their bullets can pierce dragon scales. It is an iron-clad rule of fantasy anime. Ichi the dragon descends from the sky and whacks his tail on the heavy to knock down some cars. In the end, Rin is forced to use her lightning magic while Kai covers it up with a jolt bullet. They act like it is a powerful combo which actually fries the dragon pretty good. Ultimately, the dragon senses danger from them and escapes before getting his ass kicked by the MC. Eventually, after dealing with the sudden threat, Jean orders everyone to stop the cars. They must rescue the men stuck in the cars thrown away by the dragon. Hours after, they reach the campsite where Rin and Kai get to stay in the biggest tent. He feels bad for taking up so much space for the two of them. Plus, he mentions that there is a female soldier tent area. But Rin doesn't want to leave Kai. He knows that she will be too anxious to hang around with them. After a few minutes, Jean and Phelan enter the tent. She reveals that this tent is for the commanding officers. While Kai and Rin are just their bodyguards to ensure people don't get suspicious about them. Before calling it out for a night, Phelan takes him out for a quick female to man chat, if that even is a thing. She will stay guard outside the tent otherwise people might suspect Jean's gender. Meanwhile, he will stand guard inside. She reminds him that Jean will take off her armor. As she speaks, Kai silently listens without making a move, hoping she will come to the point. Phelan mentions that Jean will be in her light clothes. And so, she doesn't want him to have any bad ideas. When the interrogation is over, he enters the tent only to find Jean receiving a back message from Rin. All is well until she starts moaning through the process. Kai raises his congress about finding a dragon scout on the border of the Urza Foundation. He worries that might have come to scout the royal capital and launch an attack. Jean assures him that the royal capital is well protected, and so they won't lose. Plus, thinking about it will just be a waste of time and energy. Just as they are about to hit the bed, Jean warns him about her toss and kick habit. But it's more like a hugging and kissing habit if you ask me. The next morning, on their way to the Low Federation, Saki mentions that their weapons are more effective on Celestials than demons. However, Kai advises her to breathe before shooting because Celestials and humans look alike. In the morning, they finally reach the capital and receive a warm welcome. Advisor Zephvin and the other soldiers are thrilled to see the heroes who took down the demon hero and reclaimed the royal capital. 
Jean also thanked them for the unexpectedly warm welcome. With that, Zephyrin turns his eyes to Phelan whom he has been acquainted with. He never thought that both would live long enough to reunite on the battlefield. Yet, Phelan thinks that she is still too young to consider that possibility. Aside from the pleasantries, Jean asks the advisor to introduce them to their commander Dedant. On their way to his office, he asks Phelan if she has any information on him. She knows that he's a descendant from the previous royal family who likes to refer to himself as the Emperor. She claims that he is a self-absorbed douchebag who views Jean as his competition. Outside the office, the assistant commander Quibery greets and escorts them inside. Unexpectedly, the Emperor far surpasses the compliments Phelan gave him. He is a bigger meathead than everyone imagined. Dante taunts them for being late, disregarding the dragon attack on their platoon as a mere excuse. Still, Jean doesn't get furious because of his behavior. She advises him to act as a better leader if he wishes to earn glory and honor from his people. Later in the group meeting, Zephyn briefs that the celestial territories are composed of four major areas, each belonging to a specific race. The problem is that they don't know where the celestial hero resides. Jean quickly volunteers to lead the search party for the hero. Dante calls her stupid for being a general on the front lines. However, Jean is just placing her life in the hands of her people, impressing every soldier present at the meeting. Late at night, Esran raves about the beauty of the assistant commander. But Rin is assumed to be lost in thought since morning. Kai notices her conversion, but she keeps the details to herself. To earn the trust of the rebel army, Jean spends the following morning mapping out the elven forest. She returns only to report her successful trip to Zephvan. She orders him to create maps of the forest and call a strategy meeting first thing tomorrow. On the other hand, Phelan is super pissed that Jean is acting reckless. She plans to give her an earful at night in the private quarters. She shares the results of their first expedition at the next strategy meeting, creating even more in awe in the soldiers. However, Dante and Quibri don't attend the meeting. In the hallways, Rin oddly asks about her. But Kai says that she won't be coming. Another meeting takes place soon after the first, but Dante doesn't show his face yet again. He is pissed off that a young reckless man like Jean is outshining him in each step. Quibri convinces him to secretly invade the elven forest and capture the enemy. Zephyn wants to tell Jean about their plans, but Danter orders him to shut up. On the other hand, Alfraya succumbs to Rasterizer's a plot and thinks that inferior races like humans, elves, and fairies should be wiped out from this world. With the hero of the Celestials under the mysterious Rasterizer, Alferi the Lord of Heavens believes that eliminating the other celestial races is the best choice of action. The Grand Elder of the Elves and her assistant can't even blink before he casts a deadly spell at them. The spell instantly incites the Grand Elder. However, the impact causes Ryoru to fall from the platform. Shocked by the incident, she can't stabilize her magic power to stop the fall, causing her to hit hard and pass out for days. After waking up after God knows how many days later, Ryoru takes a few minutes to remember what's going on. Some hidden elves inform her that she's been sleeping for days. They are thankful that she is back. <laughs> Still, the elves want to know the whereabouts of the Great Elven. Without saying much, she orders the elves to gather everyone, the fairies, and even the dwarves. The single house of the elves starts buzzing with rumors. They can't believe she wants the elves to breathe the same air as dwarves. Further, they don't know what to do with the fresh humans they caught recently. She thinks about this for humans when suddenly a bright idea hits her head. On the other hand, Jean, Phelan, Kai, Rin with two backgrounds enter the elven forest. They are worried about Dante and his platoon who haven't contacted them for the past few days. They know his unhealthy obsession with Jean forced him to venture into the elven forest without considering the risks. However, Kai believes that his assistant commander might be the one to blame. He explains that elves can hide their long ears, imitating humans with ease. She might be an elven spy, keeping the humans under close observation. 
Upon hearing this, Jean concludes that there might be more spies in the rebel army. Once they return, Rin would need to examine everyone closely to ensure everyone's safety. In the meantime, she whispers into his ears that there is an elf nearby. Kai informs them about this development, claiming Rin has gone through special training to sense magic. Being the man who defeated Vancessa makes him credible enough for Jean and Phelan to trust. Soon, they come across an area filled with rebel army weapons. Phelan explains that this is most likely the area where the humans were captured. Although, Jean can't believe that his platoon would fall for an obvious trap set in front of their eyes. Kai directs their attention to the trees above, revealing the real trap. He read about the elves' habit to set multiple magic traps in one place. The traps are expertly blended with nature, making it difficult for even Jean to locate. Afterwards, Rin continues in the direction of the elven scent. However, her path ends in the middle of nowhere. However, before they know it, a giant magic circle teleports them to the entrance of the elven forest. Asran accidentally touches Saki's non-existing giant, leading them to argue in enemy territory. Before they know it, Jean gets annoyed and tells them to shut it. She deems them fools for making noise in the enemy territory like a bachelor party. Kai explains that the giant magic circle teleported them into the elven forest. Suddenly, a small creature named Silk comes running out of the bushes, chasing an insect. She wants the insect to be her best reminder. Phelan informs them that she is a great fairy, and thus everyone must be on guard. Silk runs around after the insect ignoring the humans until Asran's long legs come in her way. She bumps into him and loses sense of everything. Upon gathering herself, Silk mistakes him for an elf. She asks which part of the forest he came from. But seconds later, she realizes Asran doesn't have any magic in his body. He reveals that none of them are slaves. They are just lame humans without any magic. Immediately, Silk gets scared of them, forcing her to cast wind magic and escape. They find it weird but Silk's cute appearance is hardly any danger to them. After following Rin's lead, they reach the entrance of the elven village. The guard draw their arrows, while Kai and the others prepare to launch a counter-attack. Unexpectedly, the so-called assistant commander arrives on the scene, telling them to hold their fire. Jean and the others taunt her name and title, revealing they know everything about her spy business. However, Quibury tells them to address her by name. Moving forward from the pleasantries, Jean demands her to release the hostages including Dante. She agrees to let them free only if the humans fight the angels on their behalf. She believes that defeating the angels won't be a hard task for the people who defeated the demon hero Vanessa. Kia steps forward asking about their motives to betray the angels. However, Quibury claims that the angels betrayed them first. Without revealing any further information, she takes them to Riaru. Before introducing herself as the Shrine Maiden, she reminds them that this is the first time humans have entered their village. They won't be welcomed by the citizens, but still it should be considered an honor. Judging from their appearance, she doesn't believe they were the ones to defeat Vanessa. However, Jean assures them that their platoon cleared the boss fight. Within a few seconds, Riaru notices that the undergarments she is wearing belong to the elves. Jean explains that the humans stole the magic items from demons near the border of the Urza Federation ten years ago. Since they weren't stolen directly from the elves, she decides to let it slide this time. Coming to the point, Riaru wants to form a contract with the humans. They must resume their great elder who's currently being held by Alfreya. She explains that there was a time when Alfreya was a gentle soul. However, now, he suddenly wanted the other races to serve under him like slaves. She and the great elder went to clear things out with him. But he didn't listen to their words. Despite Kai understanding the elves' delicate positions, they fear that this might be an ambush from the elves and the angels. Surprisingly, Quibury offers her life as collateral to the cause. However, Phelan doesn't believe her life holds any meaning compared to the six of them. She forces Ryuro to accompany them on the mission. And if things go south, her life will be taken immediately. 
obviously, Quibury objects to this idea. But Ryuru reminds her that it was the elves who lost their great elder. In the meantime, the dwarves and the fairies are strong as ever. If they don't hurry this up, they might face a civil war. They can't fight amongst themselves when the hero of the Celestials is after their heads. At that moment, Phelan accepts her life as collateral for the mission. Ryuru then orders the fairs and the dwarves hidden in the trees to listen to her orders and retreat. They are forbidden from taking any action until she returns. On that note, she asks Silk to prepare sitting for the guest, as the details will take a while. After spending the entire day with the elves, Rin sleeps like a baby. However, Kai forces himself to stay awake to guard everyone. Suddenly, Ryaru arrives on the scene, seeking a few answers. Firstly, she doesn't understand why the humans try to stay awake if they need to light a fire. She promises that none of the citizens in the forest will make a move on them until the contract is over. This allows Kai to take a breather and relax. Ryaru also sits down, ready to ask him the questions. He thinks she wants the methods they used to kill Vanessa. However, the Shrine Maiden knows her limit. Still, she wants to know if the power he used to kill Vanessa will be enough for the Lord of the Heavens Alfreya. At this point, Kai starts to realize this is not only a rescue mission. She actually wants him to fight with Alfreya, removing an obstacle from their path. Ryuru tells him straight to his face, they will be facing Alfreya no matter what measures everyone takes. There is no way in hell they can enter and escape the Angel's Palace without him noticing. After waking up with little rest, the search unit and informs the base about their current status. Following the elf's lead, they reach the giant tree which is also an entrance to the Angel Palace. She activates a double-rigged <coughs> magical circle placed at the base of the tree. Kai wonders if they were prepared for the human invasion. However, Ryuru insults them on the stop, reminding them that none of the races are afraid of them. They placed such thorough traps for the demons, mythical beasts, and spirits. He reveals that the demons thought the same about the humans. This is the reason they focused most of their strength fighting the other races at the border. He believes that most of the angels are also underestimating the humans, and thus most of their forces will be at the border as well. At this point, Ryaru realizes that his victory over the demons wasn't dumb luck. She takes them upstairs using a teleportation spell only to be greeted by a stench of burning flames. For some strange reason, most of the fortress guards are burning in flames. She checks their pulses, revealing none of them are dead. But still, they can't fathom who would have done such a thing. Since there is no time to dwell, Ryuru continues the journey to the top of the Angel Palace. Phelan realizes that having an elf beside them helped them a lot. However, their celebratory moods don't last long, as the War Angel Vicious casts a wind spell at them, forcing them to dodge in the nick of time. The Angel of War knew that the Earth Dwellers won't stay silent for long, Ryuru can't believe that she is looking down upon them just because of her wings. However, she has no concerns for their feelings. She is an angel who follows the will of the Lord of Heaven's Alfreya. The other angels were also like the Earth Dwellers, disobeying the Supreme One's orders. And so, Alfreya personally handled their punishment. Soon, he will be executing the Great Elder of the Elven Village to make an example out of her. This will force the other races to bow down before the Supreme One's authority. Phelan doesn't wait for the boss walkthrough to finish and attacks before getting bored. Vicious is amused that mere humans have the guts to attack her head-on. In the meantime, Phelan tells Jean and the others to continue while they take care of Vicious. She doesn't want to allow the others to escape, but Asran and Saki's constant firing keeps her distracted. Still, on the next floor, they are attacked by a giant angel covered in metal named Raphaelo. Luckily, Rin is able to match his raw strength, countering the attack. She is forced to stay behind while the rest move on. Even with that being the case, Kai tells her to catch up to them as soon as possible. Raphaelo pities her for staying behind and fighting hopeless battles. But she unveils her true identity, planning to exert all her strength. 
on the second last floor before reaching the palace. Ryuru asks them to wait. She walks closer to a pillar to disarm the barrier around it. As she continues disarming all the barriers, Kai comments on the scene. Jean agrees with him that the hero should have these many barriers. She also apologizes to him for making them fight Vanessa alone. However, this time she will join the fight as well. Eventually, they reach the top floor, where the Great Elder is crystallized. At the same time, Lord Alfreya appears out of nowhere to deliver his speech that no one really cares about. He thinks that only angels deserve to enjoy the blessing sent down from the heavens. After entering the angel's castle, the tide of battle completely changes when the angel of war Vicious sticks her nose where it doesn't belong. The first thing she does is burn their insults to pieces, calling Reiron a nasty snot. On top of that, she wants to make an example for the elves and the humans to avoid these peckish fights in the future. But before she can even swing her sword, Fling intervenes with her Drake's Fang's double trouble. Upon getting an idea of her strength, she tells Jean and the others to continue their journey. However, Vicious the chick who never got a reality check can't believe humans would have balls to fight angels. At the same time, Rin manages to stop the Metalhead's attack, allowing the others to move forward. On the upper floor, Jean apologizes for ghosting him against the battle with Vanessa. Though, this time things are going to be different, as Ulfraya will be facing humanity's strongest duo. As they reach the top, Reiron finds the Great Elder held in a cage made of magic. She begs Ulfraya to show mercy, but that psycho is more interested in delivering his nose of egotistical bullshit. After clicking the skip button, the battle downstairs gets heated with Vicious on the offense. With time and multiple exchanges, she notices that Phelan wields a weapon from the mythical beasts called Drake's Fange. She heard that its power erupts upon impact with another magical weapon. Phelan is impressed by her knowledge of magical items, but that comes with the job description, as the Celestials are masters at forging weapons. Yet, Phelan can't understand why her lord is forcing slavery onto those same Celestials. Like every villain in pretty much anywhere, Vicious says that humans can't fathom their reasoning. On the other hand, he can't believe that she would be able to counter his moves. Yet not only does she counter, Rin lands an attack on him. Mr. Metals compliments her for piercing through his divine armor. But she knows that it's a load of bull crap. In reality, he is unfazed by her attacks. But that is nothing new, since the angels love their superiority complex. This is the reason they look down upon even the elves, fairies, and dwarves. At this point, he is interested in her origins. She answers truthfully, revealing her origins are unknown. Furthermore, she doesn't want to know until Kai stays beside her. Back on the top floor, Elfria, the judge, jury, and executioner declares a verdict for the Great Elder. Reiron gets flashbacks of the time when Elfria was the kindest of them all. Now she claims that he is not fit to lead the Celestials. Still, no one listens to a background character, and thus decides to get rid of the bug. Without knowing whether Code Holder can stop his attack or not, Kai intervenes to save her life while praying for this to work. And the gamble unexpectedly works, leaving Alfreya wondering who's this guy. He asks if he has any DNA tests to prove that his parents were his parents, Honestly, he thinks that he is an elf under a disguise. However, Kai claims that he is a human. This confuses Elfria to an extent which the 72 genders failed to reach. Naturally, he asks why Kai saved an elf of all things. Being a straight shooter, Kai reveals that Reiron's life is precious to the elves. If she gets hurt, then the entire clan would hold them in prejudice. Although, the long ears and their jugs would have been enough of a reason for me. <laughs> Yet, Ofraya doesn't agree with his logic. In his eyes his life and the puny elf's life are not of importance. But one miscalculation in his plans would have burnt them both to ashes. Despite this, he acknowledges his sword to be something extraordinary. Kai doesn't let the chance to boast slide and reveals that the dark demon empress Vanessa and her magic were useless against his sword. Not only that, his sword carries the potential to challenge him. 
the so-called mightiest being in heavens. After processing this information, Elfria laughs out loud at the dirty demon. He can't believe that she was defeated by a mere human. But Kai expresses his doubt, which makes him realize that he's also got an ego issue for being the MC. Kai claims that Vanessa was much better than him. At least, she didn't try to execute her own subordinates. No matter what he says, Alfriar refuses to accept his wrongdoings, claiming he can decide who lives and who is a waste of oxygen. Once again, he highlights himself as the brilliant of all beings, another villain 101 but Jean refuses to listen to his crap. She attacks with her elven blow, shattering all of his defenses and drawing first blood. With that, he loses his cool and goes on the offensive. Using a magical item, he summons heavenly lightning. However, the elven garments underneath her armor saves Jean from major damage. Alfria highlights the recoils for using elven technology with zero mana. Kai gets worried for her safety but dismisses him, saying they will talk after the battle. As the attacks continue, even Reiron starts fighting against them. She saves everyone from multiple bolts of lightning using her own magic. Being in a human's debt is worse than dying by Alfria's hand. Kai mentions that having four against one would be much better odds, and so, she rushes to save the Great Elder from the coffin. Alfria quickly attacks her, but the spell she casted before takes a hit instead. Unfortunately, she can't break through the coffin even with her elven treasure. At that moment, she realizes that a coffin that can hold the Great Elder who is only second to the Great Hero can't be broken. However, all of this doesn't make any sense even if it's Alfria. Using multiple magic items must have its backlash. Yet, for some strange reason, he isn't showing any signs of fatigue or loss of magic power. She wonders if this new power of his is the reason for the sudden change in his attitude. Unexpectedly, he claims that his change wasn't sudden. He just got a new subordinate to accompany him. In that moment, Last Riser comes out of the portal and stands beside him, shocking everyone. On the lower floors, the Metal Angel and Rin go toe-to-toe -to -toe matching fist by fist. Despite fearing his strikes, she thinks that he is holding back his power. Upon hearing this, he gets serious and attacks her seriously, sullying one of her wings. Rin immediately gets furious over her wings. She unleashes a powerful magic attack composed of physical and magical elements, knocking him the hell out. At the same time, Phelan also keeps Vicious at bay. They keep exchanging swords with Ashran and Saki on the back up. While keeping her attention to herself, she orders them to target her wings. Yet, none of the shots hit its target due to vicious maneuverability. Things change when they throw a smoke bomb in the area, allowing Phelan to take advantage and strike her wings. She reveals that an angel's source of power and weakness are their wings. Vicious can't believe that humans would have this information. But Phelan tells her that a man claiming to be from another world told them everything. Back on Rin's side, the angel takes off his mask and allows her to pass. Unexpectedly, ever since the day Alfria changed, he and Vicious have been waiting for this day. Even if things have gone far, Vicious wants to apologize to her friends the Great Elder and Reiron. She accepts her fate to be slain but Phelan refuses to take action. She knows an angel wouldn't clash swords with her and fly to keep their advantage. Yet it was clear that Vicious was holding all this time. She gives her a chance to apologize face to face only if she takes them with her. On the top floor, Alfria orders Last Riser to attack the humans without knowing what he's gotten himself into. The shockwave sends Jean flying out of the boundary, but Rin manifests to catch her in the nick of time giving her enough time to take a direct shot. When things get calm, Kai asks if he is the one behind the world reincarnation. To his surprise, Alfria doesn't even know what the term refers to unlike Vanessa. This throws him off since his real mission is to figure out the truth about this fake world and return to the original one. After a brief thought, Kai wonders if he remembers the name Prophet Sid. Within seconds, the name reminds him of something. He utters some words regarding a thing that Sid gave him. 
Soon, Last Riser notices that his memories of the original world are returning, forcing her to attack him. She or whatever the hell it is recognizes the fluctuation in his brain from the taboo word, Sid. Just like before, she initiates Code Zero protocols to erase this defective version of Elfree from the world. Unfortunately, before he could understand the situation, the spell disintegrated him into nothingness while the others stood still. With that, Last Riser shows herself out with a magic hop device. However, their troubles don't end, as an avatar of the Hero of Celestials with black wings appears out of nowhere. He is just like the Last Riser without any emotions or anything. Furthermore, the thing gets access to his memories which increases his power to an extreme extent. Just a mere shockwave of his scream is enough to overwhelm everyone. At some point, Kai recognizes this pressure from the time when he was being transported to this world. He realizes that this is not another world, but the last riser somehow overwritten the old one. And now, they did the same thing with one of the four heroes. On top of that, he only remembers the part about his arrogant desires, becoming an heartless angel. He casts magic without using an item, something that is despised by the Celestials. However, the power of his attacks surpasses a magic items. Rin tries to block it, but eventually her shield is shattered, knocking her and Jean out cold. Being one of the Celestials, Reiron can't believe that he just used magic without his items. Despite everything, she still tries to use the good old talk no jutsu, reminding him that he is just chipping away at his life. Plus, not using magic items is something to be ashamed of. Angered, Reiron uses her seven guardian princess to attack, but they are blown to pieces. Alfreya takes her advice into account and uses his sword to slice through her attacks and land a fatal blow. Ultimately, Kai loses his cool and locks the sword with him. He tells Alfreya that somewhere deep inside she hoped for his return. He disregards her feelings as nothing but laughable and irritation. Kai claims that he would have understood if the hero standing in front of him was the same one that Reiron respected. However, Alfreya explains that he doesn't have time for such weakling bullshit. The two eventually break the standoff and Kai realizes that he is not the real celestial hero. He is just a fake maid with Last Riser's weird magic. As they exchange words, Reiron and Jean regain some of their consciousness. She is in awe of his choice of words and cares for her feelings. But her powerlessness makes her unable to do anything but really on his strength. At the same time, Rin also calls out his name, even while being unconscious. With Rin unconscious on the ground, the only thing Jean and Reiron could manage to do is watch, and here's the heroes clash swords with each other. What else can women even do at critical moments? As Kai and Elfria's sword lock down, he asks if his sword can regenerate after breaking in just seconds. He reveals that also Reiron Seven Princess worked like a charm. However, his sword's ability to regenerate in split seconds allowed it to break through the barriers and land a fatal blow. Alfreya confirms his suspicion, claiming it is the work of heaven itself. This arrogant little shit thinks God is on his side. He says that his power is absolute and can't be blocked by a mere magic item. Finally, the stalemate breaks when Alfreya backs down to charge for another attack. During this time, he acknowledges that Celestials don't need magic items or second-hand objects to destroy him. He wants the inferior races to accept him as the hero appointed by the heavens. They should just become his slaves and call it a day. However, Kai knows that the heroes of all the races were supposed to protect their people. But his statement is nothing but a plea from an inferior race in Alfreya's eyes. Upon hearing this, Kai decides to show him the power of the human spirit. Before long, Jean gets worried about Kai. She asks Reiron if he is the better swordsman. She agrees with her, but the fight is more than just swordplay. Seconds later, he launches the heavy sword strike yet Kai manages to counter it. He continues parrying three consecutive strikes which pisses him off enough to throw the sword away. However, the throw wasn't just rage quit, as Jean realizes that Alfreya intends to destroy the Angel Palace itself. At this point, Reiron at this point knows that they need to work together if they want to win against him. 
In the meantime, Kai doesn't give a single second to let him go on the offense. With countless sword strikes on the shield, Kai breaks the shield, and on top of that injures Alfreya while he stands still. Naturally, his ego takes a big hit when the so-called inferior race draws first blood. Immediately, Alfreya lets out his anger, grabbing him by the neck which causes him to lose grip over Code Holder. As his attention is focused on killing Kai, the girls combine their magic items to unleash the full power of Jean's long bow. The strike is so powerful that it shocks and irritates, leading him to free Kai. He fully understands that Alfreya is standing on his last leg, and one more attack would do the job. With Code Holder not in his reach, he utilizes his weapons from the old world to turn him upside down. But obviously that isn't enough to do the job, and so he unleashes a powerful back with gas release to increase its impact, which easily knocks him out cold. Once defeated a ray of light and darkness dispersed from his body, signaling that Alfreya has returned to his original state. He can't believe that he was the one to lose his wings and fall down to earth. Just be sure though, Kai asks if he has actually gone back to being fixed. Rashin however ignores the security protocols and bolts right ahead with a worried look on her face. Despite her feelings, Alfreya reminds them that the Angel Palace is going to crash soon. He tells Reiron that her pity and love is wasted on him, especially when he did horrible things to the other Celestials. At the same time, the cage holding the Great Elder vanishes into thin air. Elfrii wants her to tell the other Celestials that everything was his fault. He will take the blame ensuring the humans and the elves don't get unnecessary blame. Upon seeing his condition, Kai realizes the same thing happened with Vanessa at the time of her death. Before long, he calls Kai out, claiming he received something from Sid in the graveyard. His exact words were, no it exists, more so it was supposed to exist. Those are the only words he spoke to him which left him confused. Kai wonders what Sid was talking about, but even Alfreya, Lord of Heaven, can't help him. All he can say is that Sid looked frustrated to an extreme extent. Furthermore, he informs Kai of the reason behind the world reincarnation. The cause was hatred and not one of the four heroes. After acknowledging him as the hero of the humans, Alfreyer recalls the moment he saved Reiron from getting killed. He thinks that was the moment the taboo code was triggered, thus Last Riser came onto the battlefield. Before turning to dust, he pleads with Kai to erase all the hatred in this new world. Afterward, Kai and the rest of the team descend to the castle to meet with the other surviving angels. First, they inform them about Alfreya's fate, leading them to mourn their inability to help him. Kai then asks if he started the change after Last Riser appeared and called himself his subordinate. When the angels confirm his suspicion, he wonders why his subordinate would attack it. On top of it, if the Last Riser would target Rin again as it did at the graveyard, Soon, they return to the camp where Rin stays unconscious for hours. She dreams of Last Riser chasing her and a man in complete black. As they run, the man in black asks if Last Riser is behind everything. Suddenly, she wakes up from shock and hugs Kai tightly. He tells her that she has been unconscious for hours which makes him worry a lot. Suddenly, Jean, the big elephant in the room, coughs to make them notice her presence. She sarcastically comments that Rin doesn't see anyone besides Kai. With that out of the way, she reminds them that there is a lot to talk about. The first thing on the agenda is what the hell is Rin. After a long story, she learns that she doesn't even know about her backstory. Guess the flashback hasn't hit her yet. Despite everything, Kai assures her that Rin is on the side of humanity. She would have burnt her on the stakes at first, but her attitude towards her changed after their victory over Vanessa. At first, Rin felt that being with Kai was all she needed. But Jean accepting her made her feel good. With the boring stuff on the side, Kai expresses his desire to tell Ashrin and Saki about the truth. Jean also doesn't think it is a bad idea, but fears that this revelation might cause an uproar in the rebel army. For now, she wants to keep it under wraps, but for diplomatic reasons. Finally, everyone gathers on the same page and ends the discussion. 
Jean decides to have fun with Rin, asking her permission to stroke her wings. She loves the softness of it, but rubbing makes her feel ticklish. Since that is the case, she doesn't hold back on the tickling and Kai gets to experience a sight for sore eyes. Early in the morning, Kai and the others attend a meeting with a new leader of the Celestials, the previous great elder of the elves. They eventually come to a truce with pretty simple terms. The humans won't be allowed passage into the vast forest ever again. In exchange, the Celestials will return all human territories to their original owners. Furthermore, they won't enter human cities. Once both parties agree on the terms, she presents the humans with new and improved elvish magic items. Jean's longbow of the moon is returned to her after being repaired by the dwarves. In the meantime, Kai receives a box full of real elvish bullets, unlike the fakes made by humans from the previous world. The dwarfs were intrigued after they saw a sample of the bullets the humans made, and couldn't wait to make some of their own. Reiron reveals that she was the one who melted the ore for the bullets, making them truly priceless. Back to the important stuff, the Great Elder asks Jean if they are going to attack the spirits in the south or the mythical beasts in the west. However, she doesn't answer since it will be crucial to their strategy. Whatever the case may be, the Great Elder claims they would need to travel through the forest if they needed to reach either side and a need for a guide would come up pretty quickly since GPS hasn't been invented yet. She is willing to throw them a bone just this once. Accepting this would be a no-brainer, but this is politics, thus the humans want to know her real motives. Full disclosure, she wants to know the truth about Lord Alfreya's betrayal and his mind getting fudged. These changes occurred ten years ago on that particular day. The giant armored angel picks up the sheets, revealing that Alfreya and Rath El fought on the outskirts of the western border without any subordinates. It was like they were colluding and conspiring to do something evil. Well, their grin seemed that way. Soon, after Last Riser appeared out of nowhere to hit the final nail in the coffin. So, she is willing to help them in exchange for the truth. Reiron hops in, saying the Great Elder is putting her kin through such a dangerous situation. If they look closely at the situation, the elf assigned to the humans would basically be a hostage. Still, she can't wait to know this person's name. The Great Elder says that this person will be her. For a moment, Reiron doesn't understand what is going on and keeps talking in a condescending tone. But when the mountain crashes, she freaks out. She begs her to change this decision. However, the Great Elder points out that she didn't budge one step away from Kai's side, which is another ball game altogether. Rin raises her eyebrows like the rock and confronts her head on. Reiron goes blank and asks Kai to come to the rescue. Yet, this Gigachad says he'll be happy to have an elf by his side. After returning to the city, Jean reports the situation to the so-called commander who lets an elven spy into his ranks because she has huge racks. I mean I would do the same thing but still. Anyways, the old man can't believe they pulled off a victory and a truce with the elves. Still, Jean reveals that the time limit is one year. She then thanks Dante for nothing except the supplies he gave them. But this fat shit is still showing attitude when a teenager does his job. He claims the Urza Federation and Low Rebel Army failed to work together. But seeing the results, it is clear that humanity won big. However, he also knows the same surprise tactics won't work against the other races. After they defeat the demon and celestial hero, the other races will change their perception of them. They will consider them a substantial threat. To counter this, a successful corporation with the rebel army fighting the spirits will be necessary if they want to win. Plus, the commander there is a veteran hero called the Lion King Bamung. He heard rumors that Phelan is acquainted with him on good terms. She doesn't let the compliment get to her head and remains calm. She acknowledges him to be a trustworthy commander. Dante stands up with his back against them, realizing that he wasn't a trustworthy commander. At this point, Phelan feels sorry for the guy. Still, she tells him that if he puts his ego aside, then Dante has the ability to lead humanity. However, he wants to leave that job to Jean. She refuses to take such a responsibility though, as her wish is to stop the war. 
On the other hand, the hero of the spirits and the hero of the mythical beasts meet up near the city. The beast girl mocks Elfria for failing to resist Last Riser's control and trying to control it instead. However, the great sage, the hero of the spirits can see through her bullshit. With the formalities out of the way, Rath El claims that the spirit race will disappear from this world. Watch this next video on screen and subscribe to not miss next part.